Hello friends, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to begin day three. What drives your life? <laughs> this, is a, uh, this is a difficult chapter to read through. It's really what this chapter is designed to do is look deep inside of you to determine your motives. Why do you want to find your purpose in life? What will it solve if, it, if you find it out? And with the purpose that you find out, would that be enough to satisfy you? This day answers those questions. Everyone's life is driven by something. There's going to be five points that we go through right now. Maybe you can relate to some of these points. Maybe you can relate to all five. But I want you, as we go through these points, to write them down and to search what drives you, what drives your life. What are you focused on? Let's begin. Most dictionaries define the verb drive as a guide to control or to direct. Whether you're driving a car, a nail, or a golf ball, you are guiding, controlling, and directing it in that moment. What is the driving force in your life? Right now you've been driven by a problem, pressure, or a deadline. You may be driven by a painful memory, a haunting fear, an unconscious belief, there are hundreds of circumstances, values, and emotions that can drive your life. We're going to talk about the five. Number one, many people are driven by guilt. They spend their entire lives running from regrets and hiding their shame. Guilt-driven people are manipulated by memories. They allow their past to control their future. They often unconsciously punish themselves, sabotaging their own success. We see an example of this in the Bible. When Cain sinned, his guilt disconnected him from God's presence, and God said, You'll be a restless wanderer on the earth. That describes most people today, wandering through life without a purpose. We are products of our past, but we don't have to be prisoners of it. Are you holding on to something right now? It's causing you to be a prisoner? Ask God to remove it. I know it's not easy. I've dealt with this myself. And I tried and tried for years to forgive. And one day I realized that it was actually causing me more harm than it was them. That what I was doing to myself had already been forgiven. But I didn't know how to. I didn't know how to release it. And one day I just decided that I was going to let it go. And it was all in God's timing. He knew I wasn't ready. But one day I did. And I was ready. And let me tell you, it was the most freeing experience I've ever had in my life. I was able to let it go. I was able to break chains.
God's the only one that could do that. I didn't know how to do it. So I asked God to show me. In a simple prayer, I just asked, Father God, I, I don't know how to do this, Lord. I need you to show me. And when I actually took action to forgive, he showed me. We see some things throughout the Bible of products of our past. But here's the great news about it. God's purpose isn't limited by our past. We see an example of this here. He turned a murderer named Moses into a leader and a crowd named Gideon into a courageous hero. And he can do amazing things within the rest of your life too. God specializes in giving people a fresh start. The Bible says what happened is for those whose guilt has been forgiven. What relief for those that have confessed their sins and God has cleared their record. That is freeing. It is freeing to receive that. But what does it say? How do we receive it? What relief for those who have confessed their sins and God has cleared their record? Well, what if the thing was done to you? And you're the one that's holding on to it. Pray to God that if there's any sin that's in your life that you are unaware of, that he makes it known to you so that you can confess it. We talked about that in day one about promises. We can't take partial promises. We have to do what, the, what God says in order to receive them. So do you want happiness? Is your life driven by guilt? Do you want to be free from that? Confess your sins to God. Get into a small group. Allow them to mold you and shape you. And you will find out happiness. The guilt can be turned into happiness. The second point that we're going to talk about People are driven by resentment and anger. They hold on to their hurts and never get over them. Instead of releasing their pain through forgiveness, they rehearse it over and over in their minds. Some resentment-driven people clam up and internalize their anger while others blow up and explode it onto others. Both responses are unhealthy and unhelpful. Resentment always hurts you more than it does the person you resent. While your offender has probably forgotten your offense and has gone on with their life, you continue to stew in the pain, perpetuating the past. Listen. Those that have hurt you in the past cannot continue to hurt you unless you hold on to the pain through resentment. Your past is your past. Nothing will change it. You're only hurting yourself with your bitterness. For your own sake, 
learn from it and let it go. The Bible says to worry yourself to death with resentment would be a foolish, senseless thing to do. Now remember I said you could have one or all five. This anger may be a result of number one. It directly attributed to mine. My anger was great. I really held on to it. Almost like a blanket where it kept me warm at night. The worst part is, is the person I was so angry at didn't even realize that they had hurt me so bad. So who was I hurting? Them or me? To worry yourself to death with resentment would be a foolish, senseless thing to do. That was me. Foolish and senseless. So when I hold on to my anger, because I feel it's the only way that I can deal with it, Hold on to it because instead of releasing it through forgiveness, it would be too easy. Maybe you feel like they need to suffer the same way that you were. But here's the thing they're not. You are. So why are you suffering? And it's not easy to let it go. But your anger is hurting you, not them. Sometimes we just need to realize that so that we can we can let go. Number three that we're going to talk about. Many people are driven by fear. I had that one too. So right now I'm three for three. <laughs> Wasn't proud of this. But if I could help someone through my experience. And praise Jesus for it. These fears may be a result of a traumatic experience, unrealistic expectations, growing up in a high control home, or even genetic predisposition. Regardless of the, the cause, fear-driven people often miss great opportunities because they are afraid to venture out. Instead, they play it safe, avoiding risk and trying to maintain the status quo. Fear is a self-imposed prison that will keep you from beginning what God intends for you to be. You must Move against it with the weapons of faith and love. The Bible says, well-formed love banishes fear. Since fear is crippling, a fearful life, fear of death, fear of judgment, is one not yet fully formed in love. So we talked about love in the previous chapter. How God's love has for you. Did God have fear when he made you? Has God ever experienced fear? No. Has Jesus ever experienced fear? No. What I find interesting in this is how do you combat fear? Two things. Faith. And love. Oh, 
So if you have faith, do you worry? Do you worry? Maybe you worry about finances. Maybe you have a fear of failure. Maybe you've been through something traumatic. And it turned into a fear. Maybe fear is driven by one of the two other ones that we talked about earlier. A fear if you forgive them, but they haven't learned anything. Fear of judgment. But fear is crippling. And what's the opposite of fear is love. Love that God gave you. Love that God has for you. Fear not is one of the most used words in the Bible. Fear not. So why is that important? Because it would keep you from becoming what God intends for you to be. So who uses fear? God doesn't use fear. Why would he use it if he was if it, to keep him from in, from doing what he wants you to do? So cast it out. Take authority over your situation. Take authority over your circumstances. Take authority over your environment. When you fear, when you feel fear coming upon you, tell it to leave. You have the authority to do that. You have the authority to change the environment that you're in. You have that authority that God has given you. So when fear comes creeping in, you can tell it to get out. And it will flee. Remember I said earlier, you will have your purpose in life. If you're stopping from what God is intending you to do, how is that helping your purpose? Next point we want to talk about is materialism. That's a difficult one. Everyone wants nice things. But the desire to acquire more becomes the whole goal of their lives. That's when we confuse position for purpose. That's when we get the self-help advice that tells us that if you want to be successful, this is what you do. You got to lie to people. You got to tell them what they want to hear. You got to promise them the world. What's that really going to get you? It's not the way I want to be successful. It's not the way I want to have my kid, my child look at me. What great is it if you have all the treasures, but the way that you acquired them was by misconceptions. It says here, drive is to always want more is based on the misconceptions, recognize that word, that having more will make you more happy, more important, and more secure. But all three ideas are untrue. Possessions only provide temporary happiness. 
because things do not change, we eventually become bored with them and then want newer, bigger, better versions. It's also a myth that if I get more, I will be more important. Self-worth and net worth are not the same. Your value is not determined by the, your valuables. And God says the most important valuable things in life are not things. In the earlier chapter, we talked that God views you as one of the most valuable things that he ever, ever created. More important than anything on earth. More important than the earth itself. You're his most prized possession. The common myth about money is that having more will make me more secure. It won't. Wealth cannot can be lost instantly through a variety of uncontrollable factors. Real security can only be found in that which can never be taken from you, your relationship with God. So you can store your treasures on earth. You're not going to take them with you. There was once a joke that someone once told me where a gentleman was dying. So he took all his gold and he decided that he wanted to take it with him. So he was buried with it. And uh, when he got to heaven, <laughs> he told Peter, he said, uh, Peter, he said, I have my most valuable possessions back on earth. And I'd like for you to bring them. I'd like to be able to bring them to heaven. So Peter says, let me talk to God. Let me see what he says. So he talks to God and says, okay, God said you can bring one thing with you. And the man jumped for joy. He already knew what it was going to be. So he goes back and he grabs all his gold and he brings it to him. And Peter says to him, of all the things that you could have bring to heaven, why would you bring pavement? See, because the streets of heaven are streets of gold. What we view as our most valuable is not the same in heaven. So how often are we looking at valuables and thinking how important they are when in the heavenly realm they're just pavement? Something they walk on. The last point that we're going to touch on is many people are driven by the need for approval. This is a tough one. This can go back to approval from your spouse, approval from children, maybe even approval from someone you hurt. It could be as simple as something from an approval from a job, or someone that maybe mentors you. Let's read what they say about approval. They allow the expectations of parents or spouses or children or teachers or friends to control their lives. Many adults are still trying to earn the approval of unpleasant parents. Others are driven by peer pressure, always worried by what others might think. Unfortunately, those who follow the crowd usually get lost in it. I don't know all the keys to success, but one key to failure is to try to please everyone. Being controlled by the opinions of others is a guaranteed way to miss God's purpose for your life. Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. There are other forces that can drive your life, but all lead to the same dead end. Unused potential, unnecessary stress, and an unfulfilled life. This 40-day journey will show you how to live a purpose-driven life, a life guided, controlled, and directed by God's purpose. Nothing matters more than knowing God's purpose for your life. 
Nothing can compensate for not knowing them. Not success, wealth, fame, or pleasure. Without a purpose, life is emotion without meaning, activity without direction, and events without reason. Without a purpose, life is trivial, petty, and pointless. So, what are the benefits? Well, I'm glad you asked. There are five great benefits of living a purpose-driven life. Knowing your purpose gives meaning to your life. Are you looking for that? We were made to have meaning. This is why people try dubious methods like astrology or physics to discover it. When life has meaning, they can bear almost anything without it. Nothing is bearable. A young man in his 20s once wrote, I feel like a failure because I'm struggling to become something. I don't even know what it is. And all, all I know now is to do, to do is to get by. Someday, if I discover my purpose, I will feel like I'm beginning to live. Wow. If I discover it, I'll feel I'm beginning to live. So what were you doing previous to that? Not living? It's a heck of a way to spend your time here. Without God, life has no purpose. And without purpose, life has no meaning. And without meaning, life has no significance or hope. In the Bible, many different people express this hopelessness. Isaiah complained, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Job said, my life drags on day by day after day, and I give up. I'm tired of living. Leave me alone. My life makes no sense. The greatest tragedy is not death, but life without purpose. So let's think about that. What are the benefits of living a purpose-driven life? I'd like for you to take some time in your journal and, and write these things down, of what you believe they are. Because I, I feel that by doing that, it's going to expose what you hold on to, what you find is important to you. It says that the condition of your heart is going to be seen by the way that you approach situations, speak to people, interact. For your mouth confesses what's in your heart. So what's in your heart? Hope is essential to your life as air and water. You need hope to cope. Dr. Bernie Siegel found he could predict which of his cancer patients would go into remission by asking, do you want to live to be 100? Those with deep, a deep sense of life purpose answered yes and were the ones most likely to survive. Hope comes from having a purpose. If you have felt hopeless, hold on. Wonderful changes are going to happen in your life as you begin to live it on purpose. God says, I know what I am planning for you. I have good plans for you, not plans to hurt you. I will give you hope and a good future. You may feel you are facing an impossible situation, but the Bible says God is able to do far more than he would ever dare to ask or even dream of, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, or hopes. God is able to do far more than we would ever dare ask or dream of. I don't know about you, but I've had some pretty good dreams where they seemed unattainable. But God wants something more for me than what I can even possibly dream of? He must love me quite a bit. That he tells me that I 
can't even imagine or even dare to ask God is able to do far more than I can even expect or want and even understand knowing your purpose simplifies your life it defines what you do and what you don't do your purpose becomes a standard you use to evaluate which activities are essential and which aren't you simply ask does this activity help me fulfill one of God's purposes for my life without a clear purpose you have no foundation on, on which to, you base decisions allocate your time or use your resources you will tend to make choices based on circumstances pressures and your mood at the moment people who don't know you people who don't know their purpose try to do too much and that causes stress fatigue and conflict I've been guilty of that I've definitely been guilty of that It is impossible to do everything people want you to do. You have just enough time to do God's will. And if you can't get it all done, it means you're trying to do more than God intended for you to do. Or possibly that you're watching too much television. <laughs> Rick had to put that quote in. Purpose-driven living leads to a simpler lifestyle and a saner schedule. The Bible says, A pretentious, showy life is an empty life. A plain and simple life is a full life. So when you're praying, thank God for your full life that you have. Thank you for His love. And thank you for the full life that He has given you. Now keep in mind, it does not say in here to have a full life, you must have a brand new house, a brand new car, Money it doesn't say any of those. Those are the world's desires. It actually says the opposite. Plain and simple life is a full life. The Lord give perfect peace to those who keep their purpose firm and put their trust in you. So you looking for peace? You want to find it? They put their trust in him. Here's another benefit. Focusing your life. It concentrates your effort and energy on what's important. You become effective by being selective. You become effective by being selective. It's human nature to get distracted by minor issues. We play trivial pursuit with our lives. Henry David Thoreau just uh, observed that people lives lives that I'm sorry. Let me observe that people live lives of quiet desperation. But today, a better description is aimless distraction. Many people are like gyroscopes, spinning around at a frantic pace, but never going anywhere. Without a clear purpose, you keep changing directions, jobs, relationships, churches, or other externals, hoping each will change and will settle the confusion or fill the emptiness in your heart. You may think maybe this time it will be different, but it doesn't solve your real problem. A lack of focus and purpose. The Bible says, don't live carelessly, unthinking. Make sure you understand what the master wants. If you want to have, if you want your life to have impact, focus it. Stop dabbing. Stop trying to do it all. Do less. Prune away even good activities to do only what matters most. Never confuse activity with productivity. You can be busy without a purpose. But what's the point? Paul said, let's keep focused on the goal, those of us who want everything God has for us. Do you think having purpose would motivate your life? You think it would help you with focusing it? 
Or do you think focus is a direct result that contributes to motivation? As you notice, as we go through these different benefits, each one plays off the next. Purpose always produces passion. Nothing energizes like a clear purpose. On the other hand, passion just dis, uh, dissipates when you lack a purpose. Just getting out of bed becomes a major chore. It is usually meaningless work, not overwork, that wears us down, zaps our strength, and robs our joy. George Bernard Shaw wrote, This is the true joy of life, the be being used up for a purpose, recognized by yourself as a mighty one, being a free, being a force of nature instead of a feverish, selfish, of grievances, complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. It's a pretty strong statement to come from somebody. You can almost say that you are put on earth to be remembered, but you are put here to prepare for eternity. So what are you preparing yourself for? Many people spend their lives trying to create a lasting legacy on earth. They want to be remembered when they're gone. Yet what ultimately matters will not be what matters, what others say about your life, but what God says. When people fail to realize is that all the achievements are eventually surpassed, records are broken, reputations fade, and, and tributes, uh, tributes are forgotten. Living to create an earthly legacy is a short-sighted goal, a wiser use of time is to build an eternal legacy. One day you will stand before God. He will do an audit of your life, a final exam, before you enter eternity. The Bible says, remember each of us will stand personally before the judgment seat of God. Yes, each of us will have, will have to give a personal account to God. Fortunately, God wants us to pass this test. So he has given us questions in advance. From the Bible, we can summarize that God will ask us two critical questions. If you have a pen, write these down. First question. What did you do with my son, Jesus Christ? God won't ask you about your religious background or doctrinal views. The only thing that matters is, did you accept Jesus and what he did for you? Did you learn to love and trust him? Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What did you do with my son, Jesus Christ? Second, what did you do with what I gave you? What did you do with your life? All the gifts, talents, opportunities, energies, relationships, and sources God gave you. Did you spend them on yourself or did you use them for the purposes God made you for? Preparing you for the two questions is the goal of this book. The first question will determine where you spend eternity. The second question will determine what you do in eternity. By the end of this book, you will you'll be ready to answer both questions. So here's a point to ponder. Living on purpose is a path to peace. Verse to remember. Isaiah 26, 3. The Lord give perfect peace to those who keep their purpose and firm and put their trust in you. And the question to ask what would my family and friends say is the driving force of my life? 
What do I want it to be? I think that question really is going to open up some things. Maybe some things that you're not ready to deal with. Maybe some things that you've been bearing for a long time. Maybe some things that you buried for so long that you don't know how to deal with them. Friends, no matter what it is, no matter how you feel about it, God does not feel the same way about you. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you, Lord. We come to you, Lord, just making you the center of our lives, Lord. Lord, we receive your son, Jesus. Lord, we receive what only he could provide for us, Lord. The atonement of our sins, Lord. The forgiveness of our past mistakes, Lord. Lord, anyone out there that is dealing with shame or anger or fear or is driven by any other habit, hurt, or hang up, you guide them. you show them what sin needs to be removed from their life, Lord. That they come and confess it to you, Lord. And that from this day forward, Lord, they are forgiven and they are free, Lord. I confess that chains will be broken, Lord. People will be set free, Lord. That no weapon formed against them, Lord, will prosper, Lord. They have put on the armor of God, Lord. And they will no longer fear. They will no longer run. They will no longer hold on to anything that does not glorify you, Lord. So, Lord, we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for your mercy and grace, Lord. And your grace is enough for us, Lord. We thank you for the full life, Lord, that you've given us. For the love that you show us every single day, Lord. We thank you for your guidance, Lord. We thank you that you are changing our lives, Lord. Day by day, Lord. And we accept it, Lord. We accept your Holy Spirit in us, Lord. We ask for a double portion of your Holy Spirit, Lord. We sing out to you, Lord. We praise out to you, Lord. And we ask you just to continue to do your work inside of us, Lord. Remove our defects, Lord. Remove what's stopping you, Lord. Let us not grow dull of hearing, Lord, but to hear you more. Lord, we receive your love. We thank you for your free gift of salvation, Lord. In Jesus' name. Friends, thank you for joining me. Uh, we will continue tomorrow, and I will see you then.